early or gauze and lace. Though faith, I fear you dine but sparely on sick a place. You ugly creep and blasted wonner, detested, shunned by sought and sinner. How dare you set your fit upon her, say fine a lady? Gay somewhere else and seek your dinner on some poor body, swift in some beggar's half at squattle. There you may creep and sprawl and sprattle. With her kindred jumping cattle in shoals and nations, where horn or bane ne'er dare unsettle your thick plantations. Now hold you there, you're out of sight, below the factrels snug and tight. Now faith you yet, you'll no be right till you've got on it the vera topmost towering height of Mrs. Bonnet. My sooth, right bold you set your nose out, as plump and grey as any groset. Oh, for some rank mercurial roset, or fell red smedum, I'd gie a sick a hearty dose on it would dress your drodum. I would not be surprised to spy you on an old wife's flannen toy, or ablin' some bit duty boy on's wily coat. But Mrs. Fine Lunardi, fie, how dare you do it? Oh, Jenny, dinna toss your head and set your beauties up a bread. You little ken what cursed speed the blast is making. Thy winks and finger ends I dread are notice taken. Oh, would some power the gifty gie us to see ourselves as others see us? It would frame money a blunder free us and foolish notion what airs in dress and gait would lay us an Eden devotion. Now this is a brilliantly constructed poem and in many ways it kind of displays Burns' genius in his political satire. He's making an observation that takes us all the way back to conversations we've had, for example, from Shakespeare's Hamlet, about this notion that people who have money and wealth are clearly more important than people who do not have money and wealth. Burns will have an obvious problem with this idea. Notice this woman sitting in church thinking she's so much better than everyone else, and he's like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that at all. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of humored by the fact that you think you can put your nose up and think you're better when in fact you've got lice on you. But it's at the conclusion of this offering that I think, again, Burns is at his greatest philosophic genius. He says it, Oh, would some power the gift he gives to see ourselves as others see us. It would free many a blunder. It would, fr it would fra many a blunder free us and foolish notion. In what airs in dress and gait would lead us. In other words, we take airs. We think we are so important. If only we could see ourselves through the eyes of other people, we would find ourselves maybe understanding ourselves maybe more clearly. This is all about perspective, and if you'll think about it, this is the Socratic intuition. Back to earlier Harvard Classics uh, lectures about Socrates and the way in which Socrates said it in Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. Try to examine ourselves and see, I, I know how I look physically, but how do people perceive me? How do they understand me? It would, it would be a very interesting question to ask your best pal, what do you really think of me? To ask your mom, your dad, what do you really see when you see me? And be honest. I, wanna, I want your honesty, and Burns is seeming to suggest that if we, could, if we could be given any power, it would be the power of perspicacity, insight, the ability to be able to see what we really are. And then, of course, we could begin to make adjustments to fix things in the light. The next text I want to look at briefly is on page 201 um, of the Harvard Classics, and it's called To a Mountain Daisy on Turning One Down with the Plow in April of 1786. We're not going to read this one, but I just want to point out, and I hope that you can run this down on your own and take a look at it. Um, this is a classic, a classic example of the way in which um, you can use one text to understand another text. If you've read To a Mouse, for example, you can read this one and he will begin by basically apologizing 
to the daisy. He says it, We modest crimson tip flower, thou smet me in an evil hour, for I may crush among the stour thy slender stem. I, 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 I've, crushed your, I've crushed your stem. To spare thee now is past my power, thou bonny gem. And of course, it's not going to be shocking that in this poem, he will say it, Such is the fate of artless maid, sweet flowerlet of the rural shade, by love's simplicity betrayed and guileless trust. Till she like thee all soiled is laid, low in the dust. In other words, he moves from the simple, wow, I stepped on a flower, I pl plowed up a flower on daisy and I crushed it, to making a powerful metaphoric statement. We're working now at 2B. That is to say, this crushed daisy is a symbol in many ways of what often happens in guy-girl relationships, where, for example, a beautiful young girl, she makes bad choices and ends up with the wrong guy or guys, and then ultimately, kind of like this flower is crushed, of course, um, for uh, the irony of all ironies, Burns himself spent a little bit of time with, shall we say it, daisies, okay? Uh, and so there's a bit of irony to that one. And yet I love, I love these, the, the ability to use one text to read uh, uh, another text. Speaking of flowers, on page 515, um, we have probably, maybe, uh, Burns' most famous, I mean, it's hard to say which is his most famous, a red, red rose. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Um, as, thou, as, fair, as fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gung dry. And, and, and you can find the rest of it. The, the, the point I want to make about this at 2B is that th this is an interesting, melodic, poetic, song-like poem. And I think there's a reason for that, um, for the success of this poem. Uh, this is a poem that will talk about love as a rose, which is of course a very, very ancient motif, and yet it's done in such beautiful rhythm that it's an easily memorable and even hymn or song, uh, uh, a poem, and I think there's some, I think that helps the poem. I want to turn now really quickly to the Song of Death on 452, um, for those of you who are working with this volume anyway. Um, the, uh, the Song of Death, um, he, he tells us that there is a tune that goes with it, and then he gives us a scene, a field of battle. Time of day, evening, the wounded and dying of the victorious army are supposed to join in the following song. In other words, the power of this one is, Burns is imagining wounded and dead and dying singing a song that goes something like this. Farewell, thou fair day, thou green earth and ye skies, now gay with the broad setting sun. Farewell, loves and friendships, ye, ten, ye dear tender ties, our race of existence is run. Thou grim king of terrors, thou life's gloomy foe, go frighten the coward and slave. Go teach them to tremble, fell tyrant, but no, no terrors hast thou to the brave. Thou strikest the dull peasant, he sinks in the dark, nor saves in the wreck of a name. Thou strikest the young hero, a glorious mark, he falls in the blaze of his fame. In the field of proud honor, our swords in our hands, our king and our country to save, while victory shines on life's last ebbing sands. Oh, who would not die with the brave? Beautiful, patriotic, lines. And this is, in many ways, I want to argue, the heart of a whole lot of what makes Burns so beloved in Scotland. His old anxiety, uh, this, uh, page 335 of this volume, is every bit the, the, the popular text as well. Of course, song, the idea here is that he'll make the argument that we should, at the end of a, of a year, be willing to let things go and move on. And I think this is also something beautiful about Burns. He's always challenging us. Uh, a translation of all anxiety is maybe to say, for the sake of old times or long, long ago, days gone by old times. This idea that, okay, we've made it to the end of a year, let's let bygones be bygones and let's move on. This is that charitable, loving, compassion inside of Burns that says, you know, life would be lived so much better if we could just let things go and kind of move on. And of course, at the end of the year, this is a great time of, in our lives to always kind of say, you know what, let's start the new year out well. The text I want to finish with is on page 502. Many have argued that of all the texts that, um, uh, that have been important, this may be the most important. Um, Scott Sway hey, um, is, the, is the often title, but it's actually Robert Bruce's March 
to um, um, to Vanny Broke. Uh, I'm sorry, to Vanny Byrne. Um, this uh, this is the great text. And for those of you who are Braveheart lovers, you love the film Braveheart, the Mel Gibson offering about um, uh, William Wallace. This is the great poem that will celebrate the whole notion of what it means to fight for a cause, to believe in a cause. Um, and I, I love this one so much that I'm going to go ahead and not only play it uh, a, a, as it's being read, but actually as it's being uh, sung. Uh, Keith Thompson does this work on YouTube. I want to give him credit for it. It's a beautiful singing, and I want to play this one for you, and, and I hope you'll just enjoy following along. instead of do or die, D, of course, the, the pronunciation of die rhyming with free. The idea behind this poem is significant, and I think it's worth our time to at least give a few seconds of reflection. The ways in which a powerful set of lines, especially set to a tune, can speak to the patriotism that underlies that quest for freedom. Notice uh, in, in our poem um, the question, what can fill a coward's grave What's so base as be a slave? Let him turn and flee. Um, freemen stand or freemen fall. Let him on me, uh, with, uh, with me. Uh, by oppressions, woes, and pains, by your sons and servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. The genius, then, of Robert Burns. Let's finish now. Three things about him we want to say. One. Burns speaks as a romantic to the notion that nature can teach us things that are quite compelling, right? So for example, so much of his texts will begin with simple references to nature and to the lessons that can be learned through nature. To a mouse comes to mind almost immediately. Number two, Burns understands the power of political prose. You can call it propaganda if you want to. But you cannot have a culture unless you have some kind of unifying ideas. And for Burns, he understood, understood as a Scotsman how important freedom was in the history of that country. And so his texts will celebrate in extremely patriotic ways the notion of freedom and the, the, the importance of standing up for what you believe to be right. Even being willing, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, being willing to die for what you know is right if that is what is necessary. 
Finally, number three, I think that Burns continues to resonate for us because he speaks to the phenomenon of what it means to be human, to live, and to know that soon, someday, you must die. Not to be frightened by that fact, but to allow that fact to inform your life, to make you better. I'm happy that uh, Dr. Elliot chose all of these songs and poems of Robert Burns. I hope that, as all, I've said in all of the Harvard Classics lectures, that you will be motivated to go on and to do your own study and your own learning. And I hope that you will find yourself picking up a copy of maybe some poetry of Burns and enjoying it. Thank you, and thank you for letting me share Burns with you.